so folks, this is Dr. Tony Yates. Uh, when we first met, actually neither of us was doctor yet, um, but we met in 2011 at UCLA um, because you were a PhD student in the Indo-European program there. I think it's the only place that actually has a PhD in Indo-European studies. In the United States. In the United States. I guess maybe Leiden and Copenhagen? Uh, yeah, a bunch of places in Germany. Indo-Germanistic. Indo they have uh, in, in Germany, but uh, other, you yeah. know, obviously other the words, other places. Yeah. Um, so much of the stuff is still in German. Um, and you took Old Norse for me uh, for right. all three quarters, because I actually taught a three quarter series there. Um, and after that, we just became friends and hang out. Went to Idlewild. Do you remember that awesome place? We go up there off exit. Oh, Andrew. yeah, that was fun. That was a good time. What a what a weird place. I just remember um, drinking a lot and then you cheating at uh cheating at some board game that we were playing. Like that do you, I don't remember what game that was, but it was very memorable. I remember that somehow poisoning your opinion of me. Um maybe Sam's anyone. Well maybe Sam. Let's uh let's let's see what folks have to ask. Um I'm going to kick it off with a question that um was asked by someone who can't be here. Cool. Uh, so here's a question from Stuart Hogler, who asks, what is the current majority or consensus view of what early Proto-European looked like? That is, do current researchers believe it looks more like a classically reconstructed Indo-European or more like an Anatolian language? In the latter case, how does this differ from the Indo-Hittite hypothesis, and why do researchers reject the Indo-Hittite hypothesis? Please answer this in five words or less. <laughs> Uh, controversial, but strong Indo-Hittite is wrong. Was that six? I, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, I mean, look, this is an ongoing point of dispute. I think the majority of American researchers and probably even, you know, I would say it's, maybe it's 50, 50. I mean, it's hard to get a sense of this, but in Germany, but um, most people go in for kind of a moderate view of, uh, of Indo-Hittite sort of. So basically for people who don't know what this means, uh, Indo-Hittite would be, so we, we know that uh, there's all these languages that we call Indo-European, right? And, um, uh, and everybody agrees that, uh, that, that Anatolian was the, you know, Anatolian and Hittite being the major representative, Anatolian was the first one to kind of split off from the rest. Mm. And then the question is just like, how different do you think that it looked? Uh, how, like how, how different does the Anatolian inclusive part of Indo-European look from the Anatolian exclusive part? That is to say the common ancestor of all of the other languages. And like, basically my view is strong Indo-Hittite is, is really, really, really off. And anybody who, I mean, I, I think that the labels Indo-Hittite and more, more recently popularly uh, Indo-Anatolian, which I guess is like marginally more accurate because, you know, Anatolian would be like the, the branch that came off altogether. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't really like these because I don't think the differences are major. And I certainly don't think they're the level of like, um, uh, the, you know, of family level differences, like the idea that, oh, that we'd have to, they're Indo-European as a family and, oh, there's some other thing, Indo-Anatolian, like this would be, you know, on the line, along the lines of like making super groups out of, out of already kind of macro families. Hmm. So the differences are not that big. I mean, it, it's basically just how many things do you think separate, again, Anatolian inclusive from Anatolian exclusive. And I, there are two big, there are really two big ones, I think, that, um, uh, almost everybody, I, I, let me not say almost everybody, but a, a large, I would say a, a significant majority of scholars agree that the, that, so like, uh, the, the, the feminine gender is one of these big ones. Um, yeah, so like the nuclear Indo European, line, sorry, that's the label I, the, the term I like to use for all of the ones that aren't Anatolian, I like to call these the nuclear Indo European languages, although there are other terms out there. Um, I like that, uh, it kind of, kind of evokes nuclear family. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good. And then you can, you can tack on a proto and you can say that you're reconstructing that. And and basically, you know, it, it, the easiest way to say this is that thing that we were calling that, you know, the neo-grammarians or, or, you know, subsequent scholars would have called 
proto-Indo-European, the classical model, now that just becomes proto-nuclear Indo-European, and I like using proto-Indo-European for the top. Um, some people, you know, again, that's what other people might use Indo-Hittite for, but I just, I just think the label is misleading and it's it overstates the differences. So, so the feminine gender would be one. Like the feminine gender is the morphological material for it is in Anatolia. It's there, um, but it is uh, not doing feminine. So, uh, so you can sort of see, you might say it's like the precursor of the feminine is there, but it's not feminine. So, um, it seems like the grammaticalization of the feminine gender looks like a really important innovation that distinguishes all of the other languages from Anatolian. Um, the more controversial one is the perfect. Hmm. Um, so the sort of the classical perfect with um, reduplication and something like resultative stative value, although I think there's interesting work now kind of challenging what the value was exactly. Um, but anyway, that sort of thing, this is, you know, the Sanskrit Jagana type and, um, uh, you know. Uh, oh, the uh, Right. So, so, okay. Yeah. So the, well, the Germanic pedagogy is a really super, right. Of course it is it's, in one way or another, it is related to the perfect. And that actually, let me come back to that. Cause I think that's a super interesting question. Exactly sure. what the relationship is, but, um, but basically, yeah. So um, the, the traditional view would be to just derive that from one way or another, from that kind of classic looking reduplicated perfect, the way that we find it in, in um, Vedic Sanskrit and in Greek and traces of in Latin. So like the reduplicated, the, the aorists that look like old, old perf or um, uh, yeah, the, sorry, the perf the Latin perfects that look like they have reduplication. So um, uh, in one way or another, that thing is related to the Anatolian or Hittite he conjugation. And uh, the, you know, the, for a long time people, uh, and there are still people who maintain this view in Leiden and elsewhere that in one way or another, you're going to try to derive the key conjugation from the perfect, or are you going to do it the other way? Put something that looks more like a key conjugation in Proto-Indo-European and then try to derive the perfect as kind of like a subclass of the key conjugation. And so if, if, if the latter were true, then um, Anatolian would have uh, an interesting archaism and uh, the the grammaticalization of the thing that we call the perfect in all those languages would be another of these big, big innovations. Hmm. Um, uh, the, my view is that the, the, the latter one is correct and you can find arguments for this. Actually, I wrote this, um, this uh, chapter of the Jared, Cl our, our old teacher, Jared Klein is that big handbook. The, God, it's got some very long name, but it's the De Gruyter handbook of, Indo-European historical and comparative linguistics, or something like that. Uh, you can find it on our website. You can, it's, it's yeah. a he's a great dude, and and uh, anyway, you can find my my view on you know sort of an articulation of my view here. But I, I think that that is uh, another innovation that sets sets the nuclear Indo European languages apart. But but let me so so okay. So those are some specific details for anyone who's like really that's those are the deep details. The big thing is when you actually get past the crappy writing systems that are used to use to write the Anatolian languages, sure. they look just like other old Indo European languages. That that's just like they look very similar. They have a lot of the similar morphological features, tons and tons of similar phonological properties. Um, they look very similar. Yeah, and uh, I think. I do think that people who, who favor a strong Indo-Hittite view, by the way, just to kind of back up what you're saying, um, yes. I think that unfortunately what that term kind of brings to mind is something like the Indo-Uralic proposal, where it's like, okay, we're trying to prove yeah. it's connected at all. But it's like, well, with nuclear Indo-European and Hittite, they're obviously connected. Most of the vocabulary is, is cognate. The verb right. yeah. is differently, but like the endings are like, they're using the same material maybe in different ways. Like there's no question about the connection. So mm -hmm. there's no use, I think, and I think this is more or less in agreement with what you're saying in, in overstating how separate his height is. That's, I, yes, 100% agree. It's just that, and that's why I think the label, keeping the label Proto-Indo-European for the top of the tree, like the one that really just includes them all, is the only thing that makes any sense to me. Uh, you know, the, you know, everybody knows the Indo-European languages. It's like uh, they have all these commonalities that of the kind that you just described, and it's 
it, it just, it really just, it's, it's, do, it's an injustice to overstate the differences between Anatolian and the rest. So, um, so yeah, so no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm anti, anti strong Indo-Hittite, but you know, some sort of modified version of these, these are, there have to be some set of features that distinguish Anatolian inclusive from exclusive has to be true. I, I think you say it well. Let's see what else we got here. I see John White asking, uh, to what extent do words associated with technology allow you to identify where in the evolution of a language a particular culture happened, i.e. words to do with farming or specific tools? Does this mean you keep an eye on archaeological findings and does this allow you to identify where Proto-Indo-European could have begun? Uh, yeah, th these answer? are, sure, yeah. Um, uh, to what extent? I'm trying to think. Uh, does this mean you keep an eye on archaeological funding? Uh, yes, 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 and I don't know. I, but yes, but yeah, the answer. I mean, the answer to all these things is yes, and and uh, bringing together linguistic and um, uh, archaeological evidence is is really really important. I mean, that's kind of how that's kind of how we do this. I mean, it, the, the I mean, the, you know, the linguistics is doing the is not really generally doing the heavy lifting here, although there are one or two interesting cases where maybe it maybe it does in the case of Indo-European. The archaeology is really doing the the heavy the heavy lifting here, and we're just kind of backing it up. I mean, so you know, there there is this you know I, I've actually always liked this term for it. I'm not sure how common, but just sort of the we do the words and things method. You know, if if we have a word reconstructed for it, if we can reconstruct a word for it, then they probably had it. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, occasionally that helps us bring things, you know, when, when we fit this in with the archaeology, it lets us do something. So maybe the most interesting case is the wheel in Indo-European, right? So, like, people talk about whether there were, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out exactly when wheeled vehicles started showing up. And uh, this is one where Anatolian and the other languages seem to split. Um, it doesn't seem like we have a word for wheel that we can set up that you find in both. So, you know, Anatolian develops word for wheel out of, out of inherited material, but words for wheel, and they're different from the words that we get in the nuclear European languages. So like, you know, there's no Latin rota or something, Sanskrit rata, et cetera. Wait, um, am I crazy or wasn't the, the same, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong language, but I thought that the root that's in English wheel and Greek kuklos was also in like a Hittite word for donut or something. Uh, let me think about that. The wheel word, so this is the uh, the chakra one, um, yeah. kreklo or whatever. I don't think that we have a reflex of that in Italian, unless I'm like forgetting something obvious, but... Uh, uh, but, but no, so, so no, I, I, I think that they, I, I'm trying to remember what the actual word that we do have right now is my brain is not, not, not totally working, but uh, maybe it'll come to me. But I think the point is that actually, this is one of the ones where they're supposed to split. There's also words for associated things like the word for axle, um, the, you know, like a wheel, wheel axle, um, is another one that people make cases about where again, Anatolian seems to do something different. Um, and so it kind of looks like, uh, Linguistic support, linguistic and archaeology seem to converge here in suggesting that um, uh, that the innovation of the wheel comes, or the, the innovation of wheeled vehicles comes uh, after the split off of Anatolian because they seem to get these things separately, and uh, and so that lets us then kind of help us put a date on it, right? So it says, you know, we think sometime between uh, forty five hundred and uh, the, 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 the oldest Proto-European proper, top of the tree, sometime between 45 and 3,500. Um, uh, the, the innovation, the Anatolian split, maybe latest, possibly like 3,500. So it, and it's gonna have to be sometime after that. And that seems to converge with the archeological evidence for when we start finding wheeled vehicles in these areas. That's, that's my kind of, you know, my, my basic understanding of this, but someone here in the comments, I noticed, uh, you know, have made has a reference to the horse, the wheel, and language. Yeah. Um, David Anthony's book on this, and he has a, a huge amount of you know, he I mean, he really amasses all of the archaeological evidence and does a really nice job of bringing it together with um, with the linguistic evidence. 
So, uh, you know, all I can say is I would recommend reading that book. Um, also, he has a few subsequent publications with Don Ringe, um, uh, where they're mm, trying to do similar things, but bringing in kind of updated, updated cladistic methods to, um, to uh, you know, substantiate the same kind of broad hypotheses. Uh, let me bring you one from out of the ask a question function at the bottom. Uh, Cameron Patterson asks, what is the current view on the spread of Indo-European? Was there a particular technology or circumstance that allowed the speakers to spread the language so widely? I believe they're used, they're, I believe they're believed to have used chariots, for example. Uh, the last bit I didn't catch, something about chariots, something. Sorry. Yeah, so, so. Oh, um, I see it, I can read it right here, okay. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I believe they are used to have used chariots. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the, you know, we believe that these guys were, you know, nomadic people up on the steppe between the Baltic and the Black Sea. And, you know, they were horse riding and then ultimately, uh, eventually, you know, with the, is the, again, kind of as I just said, sort of uh, in the nuclear, the non-Anatolian European languages, uh, you get really the the um wheeled vehicles you know playing a role in the spread but basically they were uh you know they were relatively mobile and didn't you know they were you know uh, the, the majority i mean the, the majority of people now subscribe so that right maybe i should back up there were like these two big views right on where where the indo-european homeland was and this correlated with two different views of who the very early indo-europeans were were they farmers um so were they farmers in anatolia or were they a uh, sort of pastoralists, you know, uh, uh, step nomads who again live, you know, uh, kind of up, uh, you know, uh, up in the steps between sort of the, the um, which you now know, like the Western. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. And, and for people who aren't aware, I I would say now the step hypothesis is, is pretty dominant. That's probably eighty five yeah. ninety percent of scholars subscribe to that. Yeah, I think that's got. I mean, every practicing Indo-European linguist subscribes to it. Whether there, are, I mean, there is there is some, I think, dissent in the archaeological community, but no, I mean, every linguist agrees that the languages are not different enough uh, at an early date for uh, for for the for the much earlier date that you need for the um, uh, for the farmers out of Anatolia hypothesis, basically. So. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I know less about, you know, I'm not, I'm not an archaeologist and know less about that community, but I think that they've mostly won the day with the archaeologists too, although that may, that may be off. I was just thinking about, you know, there used to be, who was it? There was at least one person, and of course, you know, I'm getting so old, maybe I'm thinking this is actually like 20 years ago, but I felt like there was at least one person who was still pretty big on the Anatolian thing lately, but maybe I'm going crazy. I mean, so many people in this field are 90 years old anyway. I mean, the big, the, uh, who, uh, the, I mean, the big guy who was really associated with the Anatolian, I mean, other, so uh, was Renfrew. And I think he's conceded a lot of the major points. Colin Renfrew, the archeologist. That's, that's um, right. He, yeah, but I, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I don't. I don't remember where he stands. Some of my colleagues could probably answer this more. But I have a lot of colleagues who do it, who are interested in um, Indo-European subgrouping and and sort of cladistic methods and trying to build the tree out. It's not. It's not. It's not as much what I work on. But um, uh, but my understanding is that he has uh, at least given up a number of the arguments. And and you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a settled question. But you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. No, and, and, and I mean, you're right. The timeline is, is so much, so much easier to believe with the step hypothesis. But, but part of what he's asking too, is whether there's particular technologies that allow them to spread so widely with the chariots or anything like that. I mean, do, do you have an opinion? Right. About um, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I know I got kind of far away from the question. I, I don't have a really great answer to that other than that they seem to be relatively mobile and that the horse played an important role. I mean, you know, they were, you know, they, they had this culture of, uh, of building outwards. Probably, you know, the, the basic idea is that they were relatively successful in battle, you know, as, as sort of, you know, as, 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 as warrior in part because they, 
were, you know, because, because of horses, because they were just more sort of more generally successful at all of these things. And when you're a pest, you sort of belong to one of these pastoralist cultures, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you are successful for a few generations, then you, you know, the population grows and there's this, you know, this, there's this increasing competition for lands, which are, uh, you know, you just need a lot of it to, to, for your herds and all of this stuff. And so people just kept getting pushed outward, um, looking further and further away. And so, yeah, they were basically, uh, you know, successful because of the horse and then able to, uh, relocate because of horses. But, you know, it, yeah, I would say that th those are the most important things. I, I mean, the, the you know, wheeled vehicles, I guess, m would probably play an important role in probably more, more so in uh, uh, actually just being successful at, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the daily, get, earning your daily bread, basically. Um, sure. I think kind of less of a role probably in battle. Although, of course, they were, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, chariot warfare was you know, a, a part of these cultures. Well, let's take another one from over here on the side. Uh, Anders Torgerson asked, does reconstruction always assume more complex inflection is older? And or do you see scenarios where grammar or inflection gets more complex as a language grows? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And the answer is, uh, off, there's many cases where it gets more, I mean, like there's lots of cases where it becomes simplified. Germanic is, a, you know, it's a, kind of the class, a great example of that. We've lost all of our morphology, all of our inflectional morphology. Or refined. What was that? Oh, refined, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, when you start, when you have endings on the end or, you know, inflectional, you know, stuff that, that, that grammatical material on the end and it, you know, you tend to lose stuff off the end of words. Um, but look here, here, a very a complete opposite case would be something like Tocharian, right? Where a Tocharian has this highly, you know, some linguists don't like the agglutinative. They have lot, you know, it's it basically, um, uh, you have some sort of a, a stem, which you then attach an oblique case marker, and then you can, it, I mean, it looks more like, uh, you know, you can basically stack suffixes uh, onto the end uh, to create pretty complex, uh, pr pretty complex words. And this is not, you know, this is clearly not something that was inherited. Right. It's surrounded by Turkic. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So many people think it's because of Turkic. And, but, you know, uh, you know, but I don't think that that, counters the point i mean you know languages this is these are the con these are the situations in which languages change and change rapidly uh you know what what if not contact is driving a lot of this stuff so um so yeah so the you know these systems can get these inflectional systems can get more uh more complex over time um are there inherent mechanisms like you know are there mechanisms sort of internal to these languages by which further complexity can emerge in these systems. Um, it seems like the answer to that is probably yes too, although it's it's maybe harder to say. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we find, you know, even stuff that we reconstruct as part of say, you know, classical Proto-Indo-European um, looks like it's relatively recently integrated into the case system. So like something like the Sanskrit endings in B, and uh, um, like, like you know, it, they kind of look like recent accretions in some in some sense. I mean, they're not there in Anatolian, for instance, and it seems mm -hmm. unlikely to be due to loss. So would maybe they were old post positions or something that got incorporated. Into, would into the example it. of the different endings in um, the dative and instrumental, the BH set versus the M set, uh, would that be an example of one of those late looking accretions in Proto-Indo-European, where it looks like different groups have added what used to be different postpositions to make their, their face in there? Ah, uh, that, yeah. I, I think what you're alluding to is like, like, are you alluding to like whether German, like, you know, the, the problem of the BH aligning in the Germanic ends, uh, you know, yeah, Germanic and Slavic have ends? Yeah. I, I don't have a strong view. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the Germanic and Balto Slavic have M in the data, but then another language. That's right. Yeah, and I, yeah, I don't have it. Like, I haven't thought hard about that problem. But yeah, that's the basic. That that would be one way of of addressing that. Is that something? But I mean, they look. Those are. It's such a weird case because those, in every other way, look so 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 parallel. So, but like you know, you don't you don't want to do this with phonology. It's like B H and M. Like you don't really want to align those. 
I, I don't know. It's it's a very I mean it's a it's a very classic problem in the field. But but w yeah, one possible way of of solving it would be to say that uh, these grammaticalized the you know the, the the you know basically those things were old yeah something like old post positions that were grammaticalized into the inflectional system um, a little bit later or after the you know after the split of these groups. But but it it really does bad things for the tree. Like Germanic and Slavic are so close in a lot of uh, in a lot of other ways that it's like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard. Well, and, and I would also add just as a, as a kind of postscript on this answer that um, if you look at Old Norse, it develops a whole rich, uh, neat, medio passive set of endings. Um, sorry, one more. The, it, sorry, old, who has a new set? Old Norse develops its own new oh, medio yeah. passive endings, right? Um, that's right. That's, that's new, and it's also a Christian, right? It's originally a separate word. That's right, yeah. So Simon here asks, are there any books on comparative Indo-European mythology you recommend? I was intrigued by the similarity of the Odin Mita poetry story and the god that retrieves the Soma from a mountain in eagle form in the Rig Veda. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try to pull. Is that, was that at the bottom, Jackson? Or is no, that, it's where on did the side. that come from? It's, it's on the side from about 11 minutes ago. Uh, OK. Uh, I just wanted to pull it up because I, I about the details, the similarity of the Odin Mead of poetry story and the god that retrieves the soma from the mountain. And the, yeah, okay. Um, I, I'm not as maybe. Well, let me take the first part of the question, and then and then we, maybe we could talk about this. You and I could talk about the second half of it. Um, compare. So I just taught comparative <laughs> European mythology last quarter. Uh, although I'm not not genuinely. This is not like among all the things I'm an expert in European, my, my jam, but here's my shot. We talked with the Jan, po Jan Puvel's textbook, Comparative Mythology, um, which is an unfortunate title because it really is specifically about Indo-European comparative mythology. I'll type that at the bottom so people know how, you're, how to spell that name. Yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's like this. And, uh, and um, it, it's a good book. It's. I mean, it's very. It's. It's. It's very good, in certain ways. It's extremely inaccessible English. It's very, very hard to read. Um, he writes in this just incredible. I mean, he has this incredible style. I don't know. I don't know what to say. But like, you're. It's full of English words that I've never heard. I mean, allegedly English words that I've never heard of. Um, but it's. Uh, but it does have. So what it does is it does like an aerial survey of Indo-European. So like it'll do like oh Vedic mythology in its Indo-European context, Greek mythology in its Indo-European context, Italic morphology, you know Latin, this or Latin and its you know its relatives. They're in, in its Indo-European. And, and I actually like that way of approaching Indo-European mythology. And then he has some sort of general. And then at the, at the, it sort of concludes the book with some big kind of, I don't know, sort of, you might just say myths, like myths that myths that look reconstructable and sort of presenting all of the evidence all in one place. Um, and I, I thought that approach was pretty good. I, I like that. Um, uh, one thing it doesn't do is to have a lot and a lot of references to secondary literature. Uh, it just doesn't have as many as you would hope and it's not that updated. I think the most recent, the most recent version of it is from the nineties. Right. So um, uh, one other place to look for a, a more recent thing, uh, but it takes a completely different approach is M uh, Martin West has a book called just Indo-European Poetry and Myth. And um, it's good, but it takes the complete opposite. Top, it does it completely top down. It says, it says you know, these are, th you know, here is a, a story that we think we know about Indo-European and tries to look for just you know, amass, you know, look for traces of it in, in, in all of the places where he can. So, um, uh, it, you know, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's good. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're both, they're both different and they're both, you know, good in different ways, but and I don't know. Yeah. There's Cal's, uh, how to kill a dragon. Oh yeah. Is, you shouldn't exclude that. Yeah. It's, it's just not, it's not the same kind of book, but yeah, that's, that's the best one. I mean, in, in a lot of ways. Right. So like if, if what we're doing well, when we reconstruct, it's a fun, read. That? it's a fun read. Yeah. 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 It's a great read. And if what we're trying to do in Indo European mythology is trying to get past just like, I mean, look like, you know, to, to sort of start from the title, it's like, we know that other cultures, not just Indo-European, had dragon myths. So what's interesting about the fact that Indo-European had a dragon myth? Well, we really want to see something like precise about it. 
Well, and he finds, I mean, what's great about How to Kill a Dragon is that it's, it's, it's not even really a mythology book. It's a poetry book. I mean, he's, what he's looking for really yeah. is, is shared poetic formula, but so much of that is mythological in nature. Right. Yeah. That it ends up being a really interesting part of mythology book. Yeah, I, I actually, yeah, if I were like, try, you know, try, I mean, in some ways that's, that book's a little harder because it, it really has a lot more ling like linguistic language material uh, for people who don't aren't familiar with the languages. But uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's a fantastic book to read. Everyone should, everyone should, everyone should get a chance to read it. Well, you can just do like what we did with Jared Klein, which is just spend like a day learning Sanskrit, a day learning Lithuanian, a day learning Gothic, and then read it. Again. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, the uh, what, so let's yeah I wanted to, the the second half of that question was interesting just because what it can you tell me about the Odin Mead thing I don't I don't uh, you know the, what what was he alluding to what is the Odin Mead story uh, it's a pretty long story but the I'm trying to think of what the nutshell of it would be Odin burrows in the form of a snake into a cave where there is a giant woman who guards the meat of poetry. If you drink the meat, it turns you into a poet. Odin sleeps with her for three nights in exchange for three drinks from it. His three drinks drain it all down. Then he turns into a bird and flies out. He's chased by her father in the form of another eagle. And that's 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 the crux of the story, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, I that that sounds cool. I mean, I have a whole video uh, about this if you want. There's also the Portico Edit translated by Jackson Crawford available from Hacker Publishing. Oh, that's a good one. I've heard. I, I, you know, I had my students read from your book. I, I don't know if I told you that. I had them read. Uh, no, no, not your most recent one from from the Poetic Edit. I had them read. Uh, I think just the, the you know just Volo Spot or something. Um, we did a very we did deep injustice to Germanic. It was really it got. It got really, it got short shrift. I think. I think that uh, neither neither myself nor my colleague who I was teaching the class with felt like we were really um, uh, up to the task. But it, there's so much cool stuff. I mean, uh, you, you know. I, I was thinking. I thought about it. I felt bad. I was like, God, he knows that I'm just trying to. I, I was worried that you. I would just be like, Oh, he's. You know, I'm just trying to uh, uh, shift the burden or whatever. But. Um, yeah, no, if I ever get a chance to teach this again, you'd be more than welcome. I'd love to have them hear this stuff from someone who actually knows uh, a lot about it, because that's not me. Um, the, I'll say one, like, before we leave this question behind, I'll just say um, that the story about the, the eagle and the soma that the question mentioned, um, I, I don't, I mean, it's an interesting, obviously the eagle thing is an interesting parallel with the with the Norse bit, but uh, the, the thing that people normally compare that story to if they're interested in following this up is, is usually the um, uh, people connected to the theft of fire myth, typically. Um, so there, it has some of the similar elements of like, um, you know, you're retrieving this, this substance, you know, some kind of a substance from the sky that is, uh, fire usually gets in one way or another claimed from the sky. Um, uh, like in, in, the, in the Greek tradition and stuff. Um, but they usually, you know, the idea is you're getting some sort of like a, a thing that's absolutely essential for, for people in, in Vedic tradition that's going to be Soma. Right. Um, there's a, so a yeah. related question was from Ivan Adele. I'm also curious about the mythology. What mostly shared mythological concepts, ideas can you name? How are they reflected in Proto-European? That's kind of what you were, you were talking about. Uh, yeah, that sounds like something I was talking about. Uh, what mostly shared mythological concepts, ideas? Um, yeah, I mean, those are, you know, those are broadly the same things. Uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, this is a very good and big question, which I can't offer like a satisfactory um, answer to. I mean, you know, uh, there are some things that we can for sure reconstruct. And then there's this just question of like, like the, you know, we can be really sure about uh, a kind of some, some fine details of the dragon slaying myth that we have in Indo-European, you know, obviously, um, which you, people should read that Watkins book for because it's fantastic. Um, oh, yeah, uh, but, there's a, but there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, there's a bunch of sort of, I don't know, you know, um, institutions that are, you know, Indo-European institutions that are kind of buried in the myths. Um, so one of the famous examples of this is the horse sacrifice, the sort of the, the royal horse sacrifice that involves like where you find 
Puval has a very good discussion of this in his book. Um, but basically, this is the, the most famous example of this is the Vedic the Ashvameda, the, the horse sacrifice, which involves basically the, the two big things are it involves, I mean, it, it, there's a bunch of other interesting details, but it involves the killing a horse and then uh, a kind of ritual copulation. So like uh, the, the guy, it's usually like, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kingship ritual, whether it's like to initiate kingship or whether it's like reestablish kingship, not a little bit less certain, but, but basically you kill a horse, the wife of the king, the queen, uh, there's like a ritual copulation with the horse. Um, probably they were not having sex, but it involves like a ritual version of this. And, you know, the horse, the, the queen spends the night with the dead horse. And, um, uh, and then there's, there, yeah, right. So like, but it, there's little, like, it's, it's not as explicit in the other traditions, but it seems like there are traces of that story in a bunch of different places. And it suggests that you have some kind of an Indo-European kingship ritual with those properties. So again, it's like, it's hard to say whether that, I don't know. Do you, do you say that, oh, that's an Indo-European myth? Well, no, more like it's, a, it's an Indo-European institution that we get access to via the mythological traditions that we find in these. Right. Yeah, and I, as I recall, the closest parallel to that specific horse ritual was actually from Ireland, which was part of yes. what makes it so persuasively Indo-European. You, you have such close detail parallels there. But in the Germanic world, too, you see a lot of horse sacrifice. And in fact, I, speaking of you know dead horse penises, I recently had a video involving a story with that in a, in a Norse saga. But that's cool. Yeah, maybe it's a trace. Maybe it's there. If you have if you have an interesting myth paper, maybe, maybe you've got something on your hands. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's also the other place where you find just the tiniest trace of this. Of course, is Hittite, where um, where in the old Hittite the well, just the Hittite laws, but. Um, uh, you, there's explicit prohibitions against having sex with a bunch of animals. So, you know, it's bad, you know. Not horses, right? Horses are okay. Horses are off the hook. Well, they're not, yeah, yeah. It's they're not, it's they're not, okay. it's not, not bad or whatever, you know, they don't, they're not like, they're like, oh, that's not a, that's not a, that's not a Hercule. That's not a, you know, uh, perversion. Or something. Oh, there's your trace of the, uh, um, uh, that is uh, related. There, there's one of these twist roots that, uh, sometimes yields word for wheel, although not the, Indo the nuclear Indian word for wheel, um, is is this word that you get in Hercule, which is um, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, it's a perversion, twisting, uh, a twisted, a twisted act. Yeah. Um, let me throw one more at you from people who couldn't be here. Uh, supporter, and this is the last one of those. Supporter CJ asked. Um, the consensus seems to be that some borrowings from Proto-Semitic happen, such as the word for seven from Semitic Saba. How frequent were these types of borrowings from what we can tell, and what do they imply about Proto-Indo-Europeans' relationship with Proto-Semitic? I, 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 uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't, I mean, if someone, if, I think that the speaker suggested that that was a consensus, and I, that's not a consensus as far uh, as I'm, as I'm as I'm or even yeah or even something that uh, you know uh, a majority of I, I, I in fact I've, only, I've maybe heard that once before but um but uh, you know without regular correspondences between it's like how do, how do you prove how do you prove how would you I mean I'm not sure how you would demonstrate that 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 was the direction of borrowing for instance or even that the two are just related beyond a kind of superficial level it, I mean I'm not even you know, I'm not totally sure where people set up the proto-Semitic homeland. I suspect it's an extremely hard question. Um, well, but is the, also, are you talking about proto, like, narrow-Semitic, or are you talking about proto-Afro-Asiatic? Right, exactly. Right. So that this, you know, that would, you'd have to be more precise about it. But any contact between those speakers and the and you know the the speakers of real proto sort of real directly reconstructable proto-European as we have it would have to be like way, 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 way back, you know, many thousands of years before that. So I, I just don't know how you would establish those. I don't know of, presumably there are Semitic loanwords in Indo-European and I, but like off the top of my head, I don't know of any that people um, strongly, strongly another, believe in. Another one people you always used to cite was wine, but Luke 
Luke Gordon. That's right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, the other way around, and that it's an Indo-European word uh, borrowed into other aerial language families. So, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great example. I I'd forgotten about that, but um, but yeah, I, yeah. But so so. But I think that yeah. I mean, do you know of any others that people allege? I am not. Um, I, I again, it really the, the seven one before. Um, but the wine one is the one that people used to say. Um, right. But I think that Luke, I need to have Luke on here. Uh, that's an interesting case that it could be the other way around. So, mm -hmm. it, it yeah, also, that would be the the Urheimats don't line up very well, right? The yeah, yeah, that right. Yeah, it's a pretty far away from anywhere that an Afroasiatic language would have been spoken, as far as we know. Right. I guess if you if you uh, if you put the homeland in Anatolia, which you know again probably not a great reason for the reason for the reasons we already discussed, but then you at least are looking at something that's more tractable in terms of that kind of borrowing. But it just doesn't seem doesn't seem very likely to me. Yeah, not to derail someone else's question, but actually the uh, the links that you all are probably more persuasive. Uh, yeah. Not yeah, I mean, look, that there are lex. There's lex. Like, you know, enough lexical material hanging around that. Uh, you know, those connections. I, I mean, I, I suspect that some of those connections are correct. I, I, you know, it, there's um. You know, one of my colleagues here at UCLA, Brent Vine, has this nice article about from. Sorry, you, I, 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 you know, I have to pull up the reference from somewhere. But anyway, he has this article about like what can we really say about something like Nostratic, like where you're going back to really trying to do, re you know, comparative reconstruction of proto families and, um, or sorry, uh, macro families. And, uh, you know, there's, there are a few things that look somewhat attractive. It's just, uh, you know, it's just not very much. I mean, once, once you get to these time depths, it's just like, there's just very little that you can say with anything, any, any real confidence. Isn't it, uh, by the way, just, trying to wrap up this question on, on two things. I think Brian Joseph and Joseph Sammons had that book called The Best Evidence for Nostratic. And they're not Nostraticists, yeah. but looking at what they thought was the best evidence for those broader lengths. Right. Second thing I just want to mention in connection with that is you mentioned Brett Vine, who was the first person who told me to study Old Norse. Oh, cool. Huh. I, I had no idea. That. Why? How did that happen? When I was in high school, I was, I, I was a fanboy about all this stuff right and and so i just like i reached out to robert bacher the paleontologist when i was 10 i reached out to brent vine the indo-europeanist when i was 17. i was yeah. like i can tell myself let me greek what else can i put for old english like what else should i do and he's like maybe you know norse <laughs> so, wow yeah huh isn't that weird yeah he not everybody answered my weird letters um but he did so did winford p layman huh oh no shit i uh uh, I never had it, you know, I never met him or never, never, cross, uh, you know, uh, he must, I mean, what year did he die? I don't know. Oh, I think he was already about 150. Um, yeah. But anyway, he was a nice guy. Uh, lots of, lots, lots of nice old Indian Europeans from Texas. Cal, of course, was from San Marcos. Uh, yeah, 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 that's true. It's true. It really, Texas is surprisingly well represented and, um, uh, but you know the majority of Indo Europeanists are really from New Jersey. It's got any New Jersey people in the comments, including me. But um, but also Brent. Brent's from New Jersey. Um, oh, I mean. hmm. uh, a ton of the you know uh, a ton, I mean just just you know the, going through the list would take me a while. It's it's a giant it's a giant list of people all from New Jersey. And most um, of Dutch and Danes. Like who's? Um, let's see. Here's a question. I don't know if either of us is super. Uh, up on, but Naomi asks, how did the genetics of ancient DNA enter into the movement theories? I don't know much about yeah. this stuff. Okay, so I can say I don't know. I mean, I the answer is this is something that people are doing now. This is very, very cool and popular now, and people are trying to um, build these trees of Indo-European uh, that where you uh, you bring together, we're, we're just, you introduce, so again, we, we sort of built up our picture of the prehistory on the basis of linguistic and archaeological evidence primarily, and now DNA just is adding an extra thing to, to kind of bring into this method about trying to put different people in different places uh, in, in the prehistory at different times. And um, 
Uh, you know, I, 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 as far as I can tell, there are no, like there's nothing conclusive that, there's nothing that people broadly agree on in the field yet, but this is something like that will, I suspect, uh, change in 10 years, people will, you know, will really have arrived at some kind of, uh, you know, so, some interesting ideas about, about prehistoric movements and stuff. There's a bunch of European projects that are working on this kind of thing right now. And, uh, but again, it's all pretty early. Hmm. I think, it's, um, I mean, maybe your questioners are no, probably no more than I do, but like maybe I think it's gotten much easier and cheaper to, um, uh, to do this stuff. And, you know, to, this, this is now like a, uh, like maybe it's just more, or maybe there's just more DNA material available uh, to compare. I, I really don't understand. I don't know enough about it to compare, but, but this is something that, uh, you know, we're kind of working it into our understanding of Indo-European prehistory uh, as we speak. I've got, I've got two people, Island Adil and Cameron um, S and Guillermo, actually three people uh, talking about Etruscan um, and what it's related to. Now there's a lot of different opinions about this. I, I'm, I'm just remembering uh, Luke again is actually someone who was, who was kind of Talk, I don't know if he's ever published anything, but he's talked a little bit about some similarities to Anatolian. What do you think about Etruscan? I'm not an, <laughs> I feel like I keep saying, I'm not an expert on this. Um, look, I've never, having looked at Etruscan, I, I don't see anything much in aligning these with an Indo-European language. I just, the, the amount of evidence that, so like what, you know, what, sometimes people want the, to line up Etruscan um, that, you know, that there's the, the little true in Etruscan. Um, would people like people like to align with Troy? Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it is true that it's not, you know, the possibly the, the right name to identify uh you know the, the the we we have this anatolian place named tarusa uh which maybe that's troy and so then it looks a little bit closer but um but beyond that kind of connection like it, it just i don't know like there, there's just not really enough there's really just not a lot of positive evidence for oh of course that there's the whole sort of italic um uh, mythological tradition which you know which would like to connect the the founders of rome to um to uh to, to troy right? right so um so those are the two pieces of things that make people want to suggest that you know etruscan was maybe in one way or another some kind of an out of you know an, an indo-european language out of anatolia or, or whatever it's you know maybe linguistic evidence for this I haven't seen anything compelling so far, although, you know, who, well, so who knows? It's not so bad, you know, compared, compared to some of these stupid languages that I work on, there's tons of it. So, um, compared to like, uh, Celtiberian or something, we're not seeing you right now, by the way, in, in your oh. paused briefly. Uh, let's see. Let me check in my... While you're looking at that, so you've talked to us for about an hour. I don't know what your time limits are. Um, uh, is it back? I, someone said someone said that I'm back, but maybe that's not. So uh, uh, I lost you. Uh, no, I see let's me. see. Are you still there? Yeah. Uh, all right, I don't know. I might have turned something off and I don't know how to turn it back on. Is there like a little... Uh, okay, hold on. All right, now I see how about... half of the screen. I see my half and I don't see you. There you are. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, so what is, okay. what is your time? What's your schedule? Ahead, like? sorry. How, how, much, how much more time do you want to spend answering questions? Because you, you've I, talked I to could do another, I, yeah, I could do another fifteen or I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you're like. I could do another fifteen or twenty minutes. I don't have any, you know, okay. no no pressing obligations. So let's see. We got. Uh, I'll take something else from down here in the um, ask a question part. And again, folks, if you can put your questions over on the right in the normal chat part, that's better. 
Um, but Alexis asks, what were the family and relation terms in Proto-Indo-European, e.g. father-in-law, mother-in-law, grandmother, grandfather, etc.? What can these terms tell us about the culture of the Indo-Europeans? Right. This is one of those questions that I'm supposed to know the answer to. Uh, we have them. I mean, we have, okay, so the, like definitely securely reconstructable. We have fa father, brother, daughter, mother, uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law. I, we think that the Indo-Europeans were, uh, patri you know, uh, um, uh, patrilocal. So, uh, but I'm trying to remember if this has anything, if, if we know that from this or from something else. I think it's because, uh, because the reason that I think one of the best linguistic evidence is for the patrilocal system is that you have the idiom uh, to lead a bride for marrying in several. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is one of the classic pieces. Yeah, exactly. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, we also have brother-in-law, but I don't remember. I, I'm trying to remember right now. It's, this is the thing that shows up. It's it famously shows up very. Uh, this is Greek dire and uh, and and other things like this. Um, I, I just don't remember if we know whether that is father-in-law, uh, sorry, brother-in-law uh, uh, on the mother's or father's side. We might. Yeah. And there's a few that are different from branch to branch that may imply some things about about relationships. Like I want to say that in like. Albanian gag or tosk, or maybe both. The word for, um, oh man, like the word for daughter is from the word for sister in law, or, or something like that. It's yeah, because it's like it's rephrased from the perspective of the family she's married into, or something like it. I can't, I can't remember how this works, but but there's a lot of a lot of the reconstruction support the patro local patrilineal idea. Yeah, for sure. That I mean, that that's you know, but uh, but yeah, I don't I don't remember how much we specifically learn from the kinship turns, other than that they are there. You know, I mean, they, they're there all famously. It's like they all and they all they all have this element. Well, not all of them. Sister doesn't, but most of them have this element either tear or maybe H two tear. So like, um, here's a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And so they all show up like here. There, I put a couple of them in the chat. They look like that. And so some people want to, you know, tear is a, is a, is a noun forming suffix in European. It makes agent nouns. Um, uh, some people would like father in one way or another to be this. We have this root PEH2. This is the protect root. This is the root of, I don't know, um, pa pastor, for example. Uh, 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 the, the pastor is the, pr the protector of sheep, presumably. Um, uh, and so, you know, some, of, some people would want to make these agent nouns. So the father would be the protector, but we actually don't really have roots for the other ones. We don't have like a bre, you know, a B-R-E, uh, sorry, not, that should be a, uh, a B-H in, bro in brother. Um, I'll forgive it. Yeah. The... Uh, but yeah, anyway, the, the, the takeaway is that, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard, but. Yeah. And it's a, it's probably a super archaic layer of the language. Anyway, yeah, so. for sure. George Pinot has a paper on this. You could Google Pinot Indo-European kinship terms or something. Um, and, uh, and you could get a pretty interesting take on this, but he ultimately, uh, I believe wants to, segment this thing with an H2 tear or something. But then with father, you're just left with a P. So what is the P? I don't know. Anyway. Wow. Um, right. Kind of sounds like baby talk. But yeah, that, that's me too. I'm, uh, you know, it's beyond, it's beyond my, uh, once it goes beyond my ability to say anything with confidence, then, then I lose, I, I start to lose interest. That is where you and I actually are very similar and why I make the internet mad all the time. Uh, Cameron Patterson asks, occasionally linguists compose short texts and reconstruct a proto-European, the most famous is Schleicher's fable, and I know of a second called The King and the God. Are there any others? People occasionally do this in their own languages. So like, um, like for instance, I'm teaching hieroglyphic Luvian right now, and uh, you know, there's someone who's done a little short text in 
uh, like a short poem in Luvian. Uh, we don't have any metrical, we don't have any poetry in Luvian, but, um, uh, or in, in hieroglyphic Luvian, but someone has actually tried to compose some just for fun. Uh, but for, for Proto-Indo-European itself, as far as I know, everyone just wants to redo Schleicher's Fable. Everyone wants to just do it and do it and do their own version of Schleicher's Fable. And, and, and the other one that, um, the, whatever, is it, the King and the God or whatever it's called. Um, I, I don't know if you're, if you're, if our questioner knows about this, but obviously there's Schleicher's version. There's some more recent versions. Andrew Bird has a version of this, um, which is relatively somewhat more modern. It's kind of got the modern notation in it. Um, but I, no, I don't know of other people writing texts in Proto Indo-European. Uh, there are some, I mean, okay, people who it's worth, you know, you, you might actually, I would, who I can recommend you should go and read. Um, yeah, that's, that's my take. I, I don't, I don't know of any. Uh, John White asks, are you able to summarize how we came to find that the cosmic hunt story was the oldest spoken story known? I don't know what that's about. I don't know what that means. Sorry. I, Cosmic, cosmic hunt. Yeah, I'm not sure what it's about. Nope. Um, sorry. Benham. Simon asks, do you think it's possible Hengist and Horsa were originally connected to the Indo-European divine twins myth that later became historicized? Uh, that is a thing that many people believe, and uh, it seems okay to me. The, yes, uh, yes, I would say that that could that that, it, that, that might be it. You know, these are, we have our, for those who don't know the Divine Norseman myth, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, t brothers, maybe twins. They're not necessarily twins in Vedic, um, but they're, they seem to be twin brothers in Greek. And, um, and they're associated with horses. The, 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 one of the two major words for this is the, the Ashvins, right? Um, so uh, Ashvina in the dual, in the duel to the two Ashvins um, that literally mean, but that, that's the way they, they're mostly called referred to in the Rig Veda, but that just means horse horsemen. So the idea that there are twins in the Germanic tradition that are a kind of a transposition of, of myth into, uh, into, yeah, into sort of a more historical terms um, seems fine by, I mean, yeah, that, yes, it seems like that, that is plausibly a reflex of the Indo-European divine twins myth. Uh, I'll take, there's, so there was one more down here and ask a question. I think it actually goes all the way back to when we were talking about Anatolian, uh, but Oliver, you can ask, does this imply that the duel was lost in Anatolian or is it just not important as an innovation? It doesn't, imp I mean, strictly speaking, the stuff that I said before doesn't imply either one. It could, it could go either way. Uh, once you've, you know, once you've set it up that way, uh, the duel could be an innovation, the duel could be a... Uh, or it could be just um, uh, just lost in Anatolian. Um, in, the, in our Indo-European morphology chapter that, again, you can find on my academia, um, the, uh, we go for, uh, we go for a, a loss in Anatolian. Um, I mean, obviously losing duels is pretty, is pretty easy. Right. It happens in lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of the languages, including the internal history of some of them. So like, you know, we have duels into in Homeric Greek, but, by the time we get to classical Greek, like this thing is, you know, it, it's basically gone. Um, yeah, uh, but the question is really, right, uh, it really crucially depends on whether you can identify, you know, the loss hypothesis really becomes even more attractive if you can identify traces of the duel in Anatolian, and lots of people argue about this. Um, yeah, again, it, I treat the problem in the Anatolian chapter. There's some, some people say there's some material in the nominal system that points to this. I, I find most of that stuff not super convincing, but the, the really crucial point um, has to do with the first person plural ending of the verbs in um, the Anatolian languages, which begins with a W rather than an N. Um, mm. So Hittite, Weni, uh, Luvian has, well, it seems to have lost the, it has uni from, from an old Weni. Um, uh, uh, yeah. A anyway, there's there's other things, but but basically, uh, people think that reflects the old dual ending, which began with a W, right? So Sanskrit V for the dual, right? Um, first person for the first person first person uh, dual. So, um, I, you know, it's it, unless you can explain that away, and you know, there are some interesting ideas out there about how to do that. It really looks like it's uh, a loss 
it just it simply it was there in Proto-European and then lost in Anatolian. But um, and I would say that that probably ninety five percent, you know, ninety nine percent of the field believes that. Right. Um, there was a link uh, posted to this cosmic hunting. Um, I don't know if either of us is going to look have time to look through all this. It's, it's a Scientific American article, but um, all right. Is, do you have? Would you like to sum up uh, in any of your your major? points today? Would you like to point us toward where people can find more of your work? Would you like to um, sing that you know, okay. word about me? Uh, hold on. Sorry. I, I got sucked into looking at this cosmic hunt thing. And, um, yeah, I did too for a moment. Like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I, I know <laughs> there's a guy who wrote me some long emails, which I, if he's somehow listening, I, I'll get back to it as soon as I can. Uh, about how he wants to derive Proto-Indo-European and uh, Iroquoian from uh, from some kind of a common source. Um, uh, I think I think I was emailed by the same person. His name is Gary something. If you're out there, Gary, I'll get to that email as soon as I can. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I don't have any. I don't have anything further to say on that. Uh, my work. I don't know. Do people? You know, I, I'm a phonologist. I work on sound systems mostly, and I just mostly do it in these old Indo-European languages. And so, you know, if you want to know about word stress systems in the oldest Indo-European languages, there's no one, you know, you should go read everything I've ever written um, because it's the, you know, it's the best stuff on the topic. No, I, I don't know. You know, I spend a lot of time fighting with Indo-Europeanists about, um, I, do you remember like your first year Indo European course? Like you get that section of Ben Fortson's excellent, you know, excellent introduction, and you get to this, this section where there's like, here's the noun, and and you start getting these accent and ablaut paradigms. You get like proto-kinetic and yeah, yeah hysterokinetic, amphikinetic, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think any of that stuff, I mean, that that's the traditional way that this has been analyzed since the 70s, and I think it's basically. You know, it's just not very insightful. It's not a very insightful way of treating uh, word stress or, you know, ablaut for that matter in these languages. And so uh, I'm trying to work towards something more interesting. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Hey, you know, one thing we never came back to is the Germanic thing. Um, uh, the Germanic strong verbs, right? You yeah. mentioned it like long ago in connection with the perfect. And uh, the traditional view is that you, get, you can get these from the perfect via some kind of dereduplication or the like. And that's not really a thing. And so... Well, there's, there's still some reduplication in Gothic. That's right. But only, it's a, right, it's basically just, it's just class seven, I think. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, and it's three not... Verbs in the course, so have it. It's not the, yeah, yeah. But it's not the verbs that, uh, that, it's not the ones that align nicely in terms of other verbs that have old perfects. So, um uh, so one, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of different ways of going about this. My friends, Ryan Sandel and Sensukov have interesting work on maybe trying to get dereduplication start in some phonological environment where it could be regular. But, um, but one, one possibility, which, you know, this is, this is an old idea that goes way back is that actually maybe not all of the, you know, m maybe the, the situation in Sanskrit and Greek really isn't that old, you know, m maybe there was some kind of intermediate stage uh, in the grammaticalization of the perfect, where you still had a bunch that were unreduplicated, if you start with like something that looks like more like the type, um, mm -hmm. uh, and Germanic maybe somehow got that, you know, like maybe some of mm -hmm. those verbs were never really reduplicated to begin with. Um, I've always thought it was a kind of That's reasonable possibility that people don't don't take into account enough. It would be a cool way in which Germanic is archaic, actually, which is what yeah. people believed uh, up until I don't know the early early 20th century. That is very, that, that is a very interesting idea. Um, yeah. I mean, in other ways, it seems that 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 Greek Indo-Iranian area has innovated. I mean, the Hicket and Nunc particle, for example. Augment. Augment. Uh, other, other things. Yeah, I, there, I mean, look, there's no way that Greek and Vedic didn't, uh, you know, do some amount of convergence in their prehistory. It just seems they're just too similar. So, yeah. you know, I, 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 
yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, there's no reason that Germanic can't be preserving some interesting archaisms. That's a cool thought. Well, sir, yeah. thank you very much for meeting with us today. Thank you very much for answering uh, all my awesome Patreon supporters' questions here. And uh, this is really fun. You have very well, very well read and interested people. Um, if they, you yeah. know, uh, I'm around and on the internet, and uh, you know, they can contact me if they are interested in stuff. I don't know. I, you know, we, we let me let me let me do one one plug in case there are young people out there. I have no idea if there. Are. Um, Indo-European program, UCLA program in the European studies is the only place to study uh, that, you know, that grants a PhD in Indo-European. It's really the best place to study Indo-European um, in the United States because it's the only place that has a dedicated program for it. Um, I think it's the best place to study Indo-European in the world. And so, uh, and you know, you uh, what was that? I'm sorry. And you teach there? For the moment, <laughs> for the moment I teach there. Um, so, uh, well, I'm sorry, one more time. And I used to. And you so, used to, right? And it was a better place when you taught here. You should come back. It's really fun. Um, but look, you know, if people are interested, take some Latin, take some Greek, um, you know, consider, consider coming here to study one day. And oh, and oh, and you know, we should say something about our, our alma mater. Our the University of Georgia. Wonderful place, Jerry Klein. I I think the greatest genius in this field. I mean, and he's also immortal and will never die. He's the greatest teacher. I, I mean, not to take anything away from any of the excellent teachers I've had. Otherwise, he's just he's just an incredible teacher. And so, if you have just a little background and you think all of this seems really cool, um, that's a you know, going to Georgia and studying with Jerry Klein is a great way to to sort of. Uh, to learn a whole bunch about Indo-European and set yourself up to do this like kind of next next step in your Indo-European journey. He will put you through your paces. I mean, yes. you know. What a dude. If you, you, know, if, you if you can learn German in a day. <laughs> yeah. You remember that, that is, that is he, he's very charitable. You know, he doesn't, he claims that he wants you to do it right away, but then, you know, you can, you can be bad at German years later. And um, it's, uh, yeah. He, um, he's, he's an incredible teacher and a really just a wonderful man and one of the most genuinely happy people that you'll ever yeah. meet. Yeah. 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 It's contagious. It really, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't spend time hanging out with him without smiling. He's a good dude. No, I mean, what, you remember when I was still, I was still at UCLA and he came to do that week long series of courses. And yeah. Just, Armenian, Armenian block seminar. Yes. It was the joy of classical Armenian. That's I mean, right. That tells, you, that tells you something about him right there. Just his his heart is in it. That dude loves Armenian, and Armenian is a hard. I mean, classical Armenian is a hard language. Like you know, just to to yeah, that's a that's a tough one. So, um, but what, what a man! I mean, man, he was he is great. I Do you remember when we were? You know, I'm going back. To, I'm going back to Virginia in August for uh, black. For for the what was it? I'm sorry. For Black Germanic Linguistics Annual Colloquium, I'm the keynote speaker. What? Yeah. Cool. Wow, you're like a celeb. I mean, not just uh, you know here on the internet, but in in that, you know in in the academy as well. I don't think I'm a celeb in the academy. Uh, I've never been a keynote for anything. I don't. I don't expect. I don't. Why would Why would anybody do that? But um, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm what are you going to talk I, about? What are you going to talk to them about? Uh, I have a couple ideas. I haven't, I haven't yet selected exactly which one I'm going to go with. Um, we ought to talk about this offline. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. But no, it's, it's going to be fun. I haven't been back there in 11 years. Hmm. Yeah. It's, I went, I went, I went back for an, an Indo-European conference there, um, maybe four or five years ago now, but yeah, it's been a long time and it's, you know, I miss it. I, I, Athens is a good town. It really, you know, I'm under underrated. I think. Yeah, I like Athens, Georgia. I like Georgia. Um, and of course, there's Luke Gordon, uh, who yeah. also went there. Uh, I need to have him on here. He teaches at the University of New Mexico now. Uh, I see is him. He, is, he gig, is he have a permanent gig there? I think. I, I think maybe. Who has a permanent gig anymore? But I think his gig is is you know, indefinitely re 
renewing. So. <clears throat> Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's sweet. Yeah, you should get him on. That dude is an interest. I mean, I've only met him a couple times with you, but he's he's an interesting guy, and you know, he did a bunch of uh, uh, cool and relatable work. You know, who doesn't want to hear about the history of wine and the word for wine? Yeah, that's a nice preview for it. I'll, I'll definitely get him on. Well, sir, it's awesome right, to see. Sir. Yeah, likewise. Um, this was really fun. We should, uh, you know, we should uh, separately separately get together and, and 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 finish catching up at some point. Yeah, I was sorry to miss you in Colorado, but uh, come back and ski or just come back, chill. I'll I'll look into it. I'll see what I got. You know, wife, kid, hard, but I, I, you know, it would be really fun to catch up. So I'll uh, I'll see what I can do. All right, sir. For now. Awesome to see you. Thank you for being on with us. And uh, to everybody else, wish you all the best. I see you, and I almost hear you. No no volume. Oh, I hear you. Okay. Uh, I hear you. Yes, now? Yes. Okay. Can everybody see and hear? Hi. Can everybody see and hear both of us? Okay, great. Tony, man, it has been almost six years. Is that, I, it seems impossible. It feels like you were just here a few minutes ago. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Like I was trying to remember the last time I would have definitely seen you because I left LA in summer 2014. I came back to do that one talk when my new book came out. My first book came out in March 2015. Did I see you then? I can't remember now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I pretty sure I uh, went to that. Some kind of like a, it was like a, a talk in the department or something. I, I vaguely yeah. remember this. Yeah, and didn't I think maybe we went back and had dinner at one of our old haunts on Wilshire? Yeah, 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 yeah. I I haven't been back to that place since, but um, but yeah, I, rem oh, I do remember was that. that. Was that place called like Cue Ball or something? I don't. You know, there was or there was the trivia place which you would hang out at, and you know we would occasionally play trivia. But then there was some other place where like I remember you were saying that you wrote a bunch of your. You wrote, you were doing writing there. You would like go there and write. Oh, yeah. Is that, do, do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like the, Yeah, it closed. Think, that was that was a place, it was almost right next door to, I think the place was called, the trivia place was called Q's. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And then right next door to that was a place actually called Bar Food. That's the place, yeah, yeah, that's the place we went, I'm pretty sure. That's anyway, actually, I don't know. That's where I wrote, that's where I translated the poetic edit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, I know that this has like a, you know, uh, this is a place where a monument was created. I just can't yeah. remember which one. Because that was my office during my last year at UCLA. Because I couldn't be in my own office because that jackass was harassing me daily. Right? So people just knew to find me at bar food on a wheelchair. Did you, you should have put like a, like a, um, uh, like a, like a paper on the window. So people like don't know that you're in there. Yeah. Well, my office, my office is a revamped store, a very lightly revamped storage closet. They painted it a cheerful color, but it does. It's clearly an old storage closet. There's no windows and uh, but the door is solid. So no one knows whether I'm in there or not ever, which is um, that's an advantage. lovely. Yeah, yeah. Advantage. Huge. I mean, I had a beautiful office in beautiful Royce Hall. And you remember you might not remember, but it had it had that frosted window thing. But then at the top, That's there right. was a clear window. He would pull chairs up to the door. <laughs> I, was in there. I mean, he was psychotic and no, and nobody cared. The police. Jackson, I think, I think you're talking about one of my treasured colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs>